proceed. Good evening, everyone. I am Batul from Clernet. I would like to take a minute to introduce our platform Clernet to everyone present here with us today. Clernet is India's one of the largest digital live CME platform where doctors generate their medical content. I would like to welcome all the esteemed speaker doctors and the participant doctors in today's live digital monthly CME that is organized by IMHADN. Indian Medical Association Juniors Doctor Network and Student Network Organization Tamil Nadu has organized this webinar to provide insights on the US MLE examination. Team Clernet is happy and proud to be the digital partner for this webinar. Please have a glimpse on the video that is going to be played. There was some lagging from the uh, network side. Uh, was the video uh, visible? Um, no, ma'am. I couldn't see it, sorry. Just a second, just a second. Now, without any further delay, I would like to welcome the moderator for today's session, Ms. Akshya Nivasini. Please take over from here and introduce the speaker, Doctor. Okay, thank you so much, Patul, uh, ma'am. And good evening and a warm welcome to all of you. This is Akshya Nivasini, State Membership Coordinator, SNO Tamil Nadu. I feel really elated to see medical students and doctors across the nation to have joined this webinar. IMA Jadian has been uh, doing a plethora of webinars on various topics with the objective of disseminating knowledge and keeping the medical community informed and updated. IMA Jadian, in collaboration with SNO Tamil Nadu, under the guidance of Dr. Abul Hasan Sir, presents a webinar on the topic, U Insights on uh, USMLE Examinations. I feel honored to introduce the speaker for the session, Dr. Shishit Sir, who has done his MBBS from Kasturba Medical College, Manipal, Sir has cleared both USMLE Step 1 and Step 2 CK with amazing scores. Sir has been a part of various conferences from Critical Care Conclave by American Heart Association to workshops conducted by ICMR, and he's also been a part of UNESCO Bioethics Students Wing. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. Any questions to be asked to the speaker will be addressed at the end of the session, so kindly drop them in the chat box. Without any further ado, over to you, sir. Hey, thank you so much for the warm welcome. You can hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. 
Excellent. All right. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. And I'm, I'm thankful to your organizations for holding this event. Definitely, uh, USMLE is a long and confusing process. So when organizations hold this kind of thing to clarify, it really helps. I was able to progress through the examinations and I'm uh, attempting the match currently myself. And I'm only able to get this far because of various seniors who advised me. So I'm hoping that my advice might be helpful to you. Okay, so without further ado, I'm just going to speak somewhat free form about the various issues and the major questions that were asked that were shared with me beforehand. So first and foremost, why USMLE, right? You have a lot of options. You have need, you can go to Germany, you can go to Australia. So this seems like a small question, but it's the most important one because the process is two years long. It's at least two years long. It's costly and it's filled with changes. So your answer for why you want to pursue uh, residency training in the US should be genuine. So if you figure that out, you can motivate yourself to work for a long time. So it could be because of the family living there. It could be because of lifestyle, because of a research mindset. But I think every student should ask themselves that question, maybe talk to seniors and understand if it is truly for them. All right. As for the process itself, as I said, it's a long process and it's a calculated risk. But every year, the process keeps involving. Many questions happen. Step one became a pass-fail exam. Step two, CS got cancelled. Various COVID changes. But every year, the match actually produces something called the match statistics. It's quite transparent. And the story that tells is despite changes every year, international medical graduates, our IMGs, are always improving their success rates, like a good 50, 60, con constantly improving percent of them match at a residency program of their dreams. So I'm going to try and tell you the ways you can apply for this process, the way you can improve your chances. Centrally, I'll tell you right now, it's you have to plan as far ahead as you can, and you have to be proactive. You do things the moment you see them. Right, so I'm going to start answering some of the questions that have been asked. So first, one of the most commonly asked questions was how to apply for the exam. Well, it's been a long time since I applied. I think it, that itself is a little process. It takes a few weeks. You have to get notarized. So I would look that up and see if the process has changed. But um, yeah, so there are multiple different steps. There's step one, two, and three. So there was also step two, CS but that has been removed. So you have step one, step two, CK, and step three. Each of them, so you need to take step one and step two before you apply for the match in September of each year. You apply for the match in September and you get your match result in March. So step one and step two have to be taken before applying. Step three can be taken later in your residency training itself, though some people say it's necessary to take it to improve your competitiveness of your application. The better application you have, the higher chance you have of matching at a better program. So the finances were regularly asked. I believe the website USMLE Sarti has a very in-depth description of this, where they break down each, uh, the cost of each part of the process from the exams, which cost around $1,200 to uh, US clinical experience that you need in your application to apply. And I believe the total price is about 15 to 18 lakhs. So it's not a process to be taken lightly. It costs quite a bit. So you have to plan ahead. And it also tells you when you can expect the high amounts of prices. Like during US clinical experience, it costs a lot during application. So you can plan ahead and save up and apply accordingly. So one more question that has been asked is which year is the best to prepare for each step? So previously, during my batch time, um, we used to uh, focus on our academics in our course and then study for your assembly during internship. This had a dual advantage. One, we can focus on our course. And two, after we go through the rotations and we know, okay, I want to do surgery or, oh, I want to do opgyn, then we can decide, oh, is your assembly right for me? So, and then you can separately study during your internship, taking an extension. But uh, nowadays, with step one being pass-fail, step one is based on your first two year subjects, pat pathology, pharmacology, and all of the same. So it makes sense to take it in third year if you have 
a large break. It varies from each candidate. Every candidate can try their own style. But I think if you have a lot of, say, virtual class, or if you have a lot of free time during third year, it makes sense to take it while the subjects are still fresh in your mind and there's no score. You just have to pass now. So it makes sense there. Step two, I don't see, I don't think it's feasible to take it until internship because you need to know your medical knowledge, which won't happen properly till final year. And it's now step two is probably going to be the most important part of your application. Previously, step one used to be the most important filter for programs, but now that's pass fail. So step two is going to become extremely important. So, and you can only take these exams once, right? So you have to do a good job. Some students have asked if coaching is necessary for these exams. I would say no. It, there are various institutes or organizations that do provide coaching. And certainly it might help be helpful for some candidates, but it is not necessary. And the vast majority of students do it by themselves using this almost standard resources now. The question bank for USMLE is called UWorld. That is by far the best uh, preparation resource. There's the textbook for the USMLE called First Aid, which is very good. And there are also Patoma videos and uh, what else? There are also various uh, videos from med education or uh, boards and beyond. You can uh, tailor it to your own preferences, try some videos from it, see which ones you like and then look into it. Again, each candidate has a different thing, but UWorld and First Aid are absolutely essential. Another thing I would suggest is I was really helped by a memorization software called Anki. It's a flashcard-based software. You can use it to prepare well in advance and memorize the difficult parts of microbiology and pharmacology. It seems complex, but it really isn't. That's easy to find online. I'm willing to share it later. Another question bank that has recently been gaining prominence is AMBOSS question bank. This one is not as uh, close to the exam as you were, but it has several questions and it'll help you prepare really well. Books, yes, first aid, pattern of the exam. So both step one and step two are quite similar. They are eight and nine hours respectively, 40, for, 40 questions per block, and I think seven and eight blocks respectively. So it's a full day exam with 40 MCQs, sorry, with something like 280 MCQs, and it's quite draining. So you have to be well ensured before the exam, take practice tests that are available and see if you're scoring near your target, near your goal. So this kind of ties into what are the universities you're aiming for, right? So your goal score-wise should match into where you want to go. If you are interested in the top of the top universities, you have to aim for the top of the top score. If you are more interested in a less competitive specialty, for example, they say family medicine is less competitive, maybe a lower score you can aim for and uh, sharpen other parts of your profile, right? So in your profile, the central aspects, what people say is they are, these colleges get 5,000, 6,000 applications. No human being can read it. So colleges use something called filters, right? So for example, they'll say step two score, where a good score will be like 230 plus, 240 plus. And they simply filter out everyone below 210. They're not going to look at that application. Whether you have a lot of other work or something, they might not even see. So you want to avoid these filters and get above that. So for that standard, a good step one score, a good step two score, some high universities might want one piece of research or more right? US clinical experience. So as for which university to aim for, which is a question has been asked, that is entirely up to you. If you are a very research interested individual, you should find a program that has a huge amount of research, a lot of mentors, good labs, right? However, if you are more interested in say community outreach, there are some programs that do incredible community outreach where they help, you know, people who have been released from prison reintegrate into society, help homeless people find their adequate health care there's all kinds of systems help uh, you know uh, victims of domestic abuse so you look ahead all of these things are available on each university's website it's quick and easy to google if you have a like concrete goal it's easier to aim towards that and sharpen your cv 
and your personal statement and things like that towards that particular program, right? Step one and two can be taken in India. There are, I think, half dozen to eight, nine centers in various metro cities. Step three has to be taken in the United States. Of course, one and two you can take anywhere. You can take in US also. That's fine. But step two you can take only in the United States. Other exams include uh, you have to take the occupational English test, which is, I don't think it will be too challenging for most of you, but uh, you have to pay for it and you have to prepare a couple of weeks for it. All steps are only a single attempt. Syllabus, these are medical exams. They are syllabus nayota. It's just everything they can ask, they will ask. But more important than anything else, any textbooks, any exercise, any mentor, most important thing is practice questions. There's like a clear correlation with how many practice questions you have solved and how high your score is, right? So keep solving, keep solving. There are various question banks. You world is the best. Amboss is good. There are multiple others. Try to solve as many as possible. One question I've been asked before, which is a little controversial, is can we study for different exams together, such as NEET or NEXT or whatever, alongside USMLE? So this, of course, I can't tell you where you are academically. Only you will know that. But I cannot honestly suggest this as a good idea because, of course, it's about medical or knowledge exams. But, for example, the focus will be vastly different. Like tuberculosis, obviously, in India is huge. It's every second answer is tuberculosis. Whereas for US assembly, it's going to be very rare. You're going to have autoimmune diseases. The focus is on biostatistics will be quite different, right? So, and plus the US assembly exams are very costly and you can only take them once. So I would not juggle multiple exams unless I'm extremely, extremely confident in your academics. It's will likely just lower your score in board. Right, So make sure you can reach your goal score without risking that. It's okay for one year if it takes an extra year to crack this exam or something like that. Because listen, your medical career, you're probably hoping it's going to be 40 years, maybe 50 years. Starting it one year later to get where you want to be in the start, that's fine. That's important. Don't risk it by trying to deal with three or four extremely difficult exams at once. It's not uh, advisable. Right, so you can apply individually. You do not need to apply through your colleges. Research, another controversial thing. So you can look at the math statistics and depending on the field you're applying for, internal medicine, no guy, no such, they will pretty much tell you the average number of research uh, publications and such by the people who have matched. So, for example, in 2021, the average match applicant in uh, internal medicine had one research project. So you analyze these statistics is up to you. That means certainly that uh, several would have had zero. The average is one, right? So it's possible to match without. But you can also look into like individual colleges, right? Some colleges will have a much higher uh, match rate for people with research. So it is not necessary. But I would say the exam keeps getting more and more competitive, right? So if you have significant time, I would say try to perform one research project. If you have interest after trying one, then certainly do more. It doesn't hurt to learn more. But uh, it's not absolutely necessary. It's up to you. Maybe if you're not so inclined or if you're not uh, liking the research project process, you can always do volunteering. They also appreciate stuff like social work. They also appreciate work experiences that you can do outside of a medical season. So yeah, you have to decide what kind of profile you want. Research is not absolutely necessary for internal medicine. For things like, say, radiology, it's absolutely necessary, very competitive fields that you have to tailor according to where you want to go. All right. Uh, required documents... I'm not certain. It changes from exam to exam. Um, for the first few, I don't think you need any specific documents. So before you match, one of the things that is vital is step one. Step two, U.S. clinical experience and letters of recommendation. So U.S. clinical experience, they like to see that you have already worked in the United States. There's various approaches to doing this. You can uh, 
talk to universities through your university, talk to universities by yourself, go and work at some local hospital, work as a scribe. There's various levels, right? So depending on which one you're applicable for, if you can work at a university, that's the best case scenario because that will help you network, help you learn the system, help you get fantastic letters. But you can also get fantastic letters just, you know, working at a local clinic with a friend of yours or something, right? So you can tailor that. But uh, definitely you do need, this is another important filter, you do need at least three letters of recommendation from US uh, doctors or professors because that is a common filter that they use. They want to see that you've worked in their country and know how their system works. So for that, of course, you'll need visas. I believe for this, since we're working under supervision, uh, tourist visa is enough. In the, in the future, when you apply for the match, you'll apply either for J1 or H1B, depending on the program. And that's uh, far away in the process. You can look into that. But uh, until then, a tourist visa is good enough. The ideal gap between step one and step two. So I'd say that the overlap between the exams is not huge. Step two is mostly clinical knowledge, whereas step one is mostly your preclinical -pre subjects. You shouldn't keep the gap too long because you know you can get used to the software, but I don't think the gap is in the top five most important things. The space between them is not as important as have you prepared well enough for step one and then have you prepared well enough for step two. The gap in between is not super significant. Some people say the gap between step two and step three, if you keep short, is beneficial for you because there's a lot of overlap. Okay, so I think that has answered most of the questions. Let me just cap it off by saying that the amount of time taken for preparation, application, where they apply to, it varies widely among candidates. But from what the statistics and what anecdotes from my own friends tell me, widely international students find a way to be successful. As long as you are proactive, you solve the questions, you reach out to people, you ask for chances and you believe in yourself, you will find a way and definitely you can give it your best. People say that step preparation has to be like extremely hardcore and you know you start sleeping. That's all junk. You can give it your best and you can live a great life at the same time, right? So try to keep it balanced and just give it your best and I'm sure you'll do well. Okay, um, does anyone have any questions? So can you share us your journey? Uh um so that like maybe like we all see you as our uh mentor like a guiding light so maybe you can share our journey like share your journey to, like yeah yeah i can i can give you my journey in brief so yeah as a uh, akshayana uh, sorry, sorry as you already shared uh, previously i'm a student from kmc i uh, joined in 14 i went through medical school and inspired by some seniors, I decided to pursue US Emily. Um, yeah, so I started, I went through medical school well enough. I enjoyed the academics. I did my own hobbies. I played a lot of chess and took part in some committees and that stuff really helps later on during interviews and all they do ask you, like, what do you do during you know, what do you do other than academics and all that? And they, they're strict about it. They are they like, no, when you're making, making it up. So have a, have a full life in college, enjoy your college life. Right. And uh, yeah. So then I studied for step one and two during my internship, COVID made a complete mess of it. Absolute postpones, lockdowns, cancellations. It was, it was not fun, but yeah. So somehow with time and with support from friends and family, I was able to clear both exams. I think I scored a 246 and a 257 in those. Further on, I took an extension and I went for clinical rotations in the US for about three, four months. And then this September, I applied for the match. Application itself is a pretty fun process. You get to um, get to meet a lot of new people. You join all these WhatsApp groups and all that and then start practicing interviews with new people, learn like different strategies. So that's currently where I am. Okay, sir. I think we have certain questions from our audience. So uh, the first question mm -hmm. is uh, from Dr. Madhumita Ganesh. Um, 
Dr. Madhumita Ganesh says that next exam is compulsory for us now. And due to this, we don't have a choice but to study for both next and US family. Any suggestions? Okay, that's unfortunate, certainly. Um, as always, we'll only really find out some things after the fact. Um, let's see. So if you don't have a choice, then you don't have a choice. Of course, you have to take it to get your degree. Your degree is, of course, the most important thing. But I think the limiting factors over here are, one, that you don't want to be an old graduate when you apply for USMLE. They look at that and they're like, oh, he graduated in 2020 and he's applying in 2025. They do not like that, right? So you want to be a recent graduate who's aiming for residency. So you don't want to graduate, take next, and then take your USMLEs, one and two. Each of them will take, I'm estimating, four to six months. It can be plus minus one month for each of you, but it will take a year just for the exams if you're not careful. So you don't want to take them too far after graduation. One way, like some of my juniors did something really inspiring where they, the COVID made a mess of everyone's schedules. It turned their third year into a virtual thing. So they took that obstacle and turned it into an opportunity where they simply, okay, third year is virtual, fine. We'll do that. We'll do our step three, prep, step one prep and we'll take step one in third year. Then we'll have less one less exam to deal with. Now step one is pass fail, so you can save. I'm certain, well, I'm not sure. I took it when it was scored, but I'm certain it's easier to take the pass fail exam. So you can take a little less time and finish it off, hopefully as soon as possible. And then you'll have only step two, right? You can only apply in September and you have to have graduated. So how that timeline works will vary according to when you graduate and how quickly. If you miss one math cycle, I think it's okay. You can fill the time with research, volunteer work, but I wouldn't miss two or more math cycles unless it's, I get a great improvement in my application. Like I get a fantastic research or a great networking opportunity. Because if you miss two math cycles, the first question every interview is going to be, what were you doing for the last few years? It will be a little aggressive. So yeah, I hope you find a way to balance those exams. Okay, sir. So another, uh, there's another question again from Dr. Madhumita Ganesh. How competitive is dermatology and internal medicine for a non-US ING? Right. Thank you for another question, doctor. So I believe dermat is rather competitive. It's not what I have applied for myself. I believe it's quite competitive. Um, dermat and radio are usually extremely competitive wherever. So there are certain fields where people say that they simply don't give it to international students. There's some truth in that statement, but it's not entirely true. I know people have matched in surgery. We know people have matched in radiology. I don't know personally anyone in Dermat, but I'm sure if I look it up, I can find it. It's certainly competitive, but that just means you have to be planning more ahead and be more proactive. So I would say first thing you would do if you are that interested is look at the statistics. Math statistics are published each year. They're mostly transparent. You can see like what percentage of the number of seats have been filled by international students, what kind of scores they have, what kind of research experience, what kind of US clinical experience they have. And then you're like, okay, so this is the 50%, uh, 50 percentile of somebody who matched. How do I become this plus 10% or if you want more buffer, this plus 20%, you know? So you'll have, you can check the targets from past year and overcome them. Okay, so is there any other questions uh, from the audience side, ma'am? Okay, I can talk about something else. So I remembered some stuff from my step one preparation. So previously, when it was a scored exam, we used to kind of divide it into three trimesters for step one. So um, now it's pass fail, things might have changed. But first you can like do a passive trimester where you just kind of watch videos and refresh your memory. Maybe if you take it in third year, you don't need to do so much of that, especially now that it's pass fail. The second trimester, you can solve questions aggressively while uh, annotating your first aid. 
and the third trimester you can take practice exams and fix your deficient areas. So that's helpful if you're taking step one anytime soon. Okay, so I think we don't have any further questions. So I think maybe we should, uh, we are nearing the end of the webinar. And so that was an amazing session, sir. I hope the delegates learned a lot on the process and how to prepare for USMLE examinations. I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Shishrit, sir, for accepting the invite amidst his hectic schedule and enlightening us with his knowledge. I would also like to extend my gratitude and thanks to Dr. Abul Hassan, sir, Dr. Venkatesh Kartikayan, sir, and Dr. Prashant, sir, and Dr. Praveen, sir, for providing me with this wonderful opportunity. But before we uh, end this session, I think uh, we have one question from Dr. Uh, Darshana Rukmani Maniwannan. Does year of gap play a significant role? Right. So at the end of the process, what's going to happen is you're going to apply and international students apply widely. You apply to world universities. So you'll apply to dozens, hundreds, right? So it varies per university. Some universities don't care at all. If you have more work experience after graduating, they like it. Some do. Some are like, we want to train a fresh graduate. We don't want someone who's been trained separately and to untrain and return. So I'd say it does matter, especially if it's quite large. But there are several groups, um, brings me to a point that I missed. There are several groups online, uh, Facebook groups, groups on Reddit, and so on. They kind, online forums, they kind of help like motivate you because you'll regularly get a post that, hey, I graduated in like 2005 and I matched this year. And here's my story and here's, what worked. Here's what did not work last year when I did not match. So I think that kind of uh, support network and that kind of information network is integral in such an overwhelming process. Gap is important, but it, it can be overcome. Definitely can be overcome. Is that the last question? No, sir. We have one more question. Uh, from sure. Dr. Vishwa, how to prepare for step two and how it is on the exam day and what else to prepare for? Excellent. Okay. Thank you for the question. Step two is more recent, so I hope I can answer. So for step two, you don't have that much passive preparation necessary. I would say avoid it altogether. Be active, solve questions because you probably are taking it in third or fourth year where your clinical knowledge is escalating, right? And so clinical exam. The the main thing you want to do is prepare your world questions like above anything else your world step two i'd say like of course individuals vary but i'd say all the textbooks for step two were they weren't helpful like you can read them and you can feel like you understand but it's not improving my scores so i avoided that i mainly just uh, stuck to your world questions questions from amboss and uh, i did a lot of anki i am like uh, flashcards because it helps separate memory from learning. So when you're learning, you can just focus on learning. If there's something to memorize, don't worry, it'll come up in the flashcards later. Um, the exam day itself is extremely long, quite tiring. So you have to build up, you have to simulate it a few times because sitting and writing exam for nine hours is not something that comes naturally, especially like, okay, you can do it. Of course you can do it, but how is your performance affected? Right? How do you shape the breaks? Right? So, and in, in, compared to step one, I found the step two questions were extremely long. Right? There was barely any time to finish each block compared to step one where I had a lot of time. So, if you're not a fast reader, you should work on that. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Any other questions from the audience side? think we are done with the question and answer session so uh, thanks again sir for this amazing session and I I would like to extend my heartful thanks again to you sir Dr. Shishirat sir for accepting the invite I would also like to extend my gratitude and thanks to Dr. Abul Hassan sir 
Dr. Venkatesh Kartikeyan sir, Dr. Prashant sir, and Dr. Praveen sir for providing me with this wonderful opportunity to conduct this webinar. I also thank Clarnet for uh, looking after all the technical aspects uh, of the session. And last but not the least, I would like to thank all of you for being such a wonderful audience. The recorded session will be uploaded in the YouTube channels of IMA JDN and SNO Tamil Nadu in a week. And the e-certificates will be sent in a couple of days to all the registered participants. So follow us on Instagram and YouTube and at SNO Tamil Nadu for regular updates and webinars. Happy learning and thank you so much, sir, for uh, coming. Thank you. Over. Thank you for inviting me. I'm sure this will be very helpful for students and um, some of you can reach out to me if you have any further doubts. I'll take time to answer them, but I will. All right. Yes. Good luck to all of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.